Hey, welcome to our summer crossroads campfires. Uh, we're inside, don't wanna burn the place down, but we gotta have some fire. So here is our camp fire for the evening. And I think it's even gonna smell good and the smoke's not gonna get in my eyes. So uh, thanks for gathering around the campfire. Uh, for me, it was the summer of 1985. Uh, I was headed into high school and I was attending an Awana scholarship camp in Mount Gilead, Sebastopol, California. The, uh, the speaker for the week was Dewey Bertolini, who would later become uh, a mentor in my life, uh, a godly man that I greatly look up to. Sadly, I don't remember the text that Dewey was preaching from, but I remember that week, the Spirit of God really got a hold of my life. And I long to follow Christ as my Lord with a, a new zeal and a fervor that I had lacked up to that point. Uh, I remember what the chapel looked like. I remember going out of the chapel one of the evenings and I remember where I was sitting in the patio and praying with a counselor. Uh, it's emblazoned in my memory and the work of God in, in my own story. It was, it was one of those sort of altar moments in my life. When we think of campfires, we often connect that to sort of moments of commitment at the end of that week at camp, those altar type moments, uh, a moment in time where you take a step forward with uh, a new commitment, a renewed commitment, um, and there is just this, this moment that just sort of doesn't quickly pass from your memory. So with that in mind, I thought that I would take our three summer crossroads campfires and talk about three commitments that I believe every believer, myself included, needs to regularly rehearse, uh, regularly sort of recommit to, and uh, just sort of get after with a fresh perspective, maybe a new perspective, and um, just hit reset for what God has called us to. So this is really gonna be me giving to you over these three campfires, the most important thing that I ever learned about uh, tonight, loving God. And then in June, the most important thing I ever learned about loving the lost. And then in July, the most important thing I ever learned about loving the church with the hope that you will make a deeper commitment uh, this summer, uh, maybe a new commitment during our little uh, campfire moment. You see, uh, I was the older brother, uh, both physically, I have one younger sister, I'm the older brother, but I was the older brother spiritually uh, and I didn't know it. Uh, I'm talking about the prodigal sons in the, the parable of the prodigal sons that Jesus tells uh, the older brother, the younger brother. The older one was the one who did all the right stuff while the younger brother was busy messing around. Uh, the older brother uh, was the one who got mad uh, when his dad showed grace upon grace to the rebellious punk younger brother who had wasted all the money and then comes back and he gets the party. The older brother's upset feel somehow that he'd gotten the short end of the stick. Uh, the older brother, and, and this certainly reflects my own heart and something I struggle with even to this day, the older brother was the one who was looking for the good grade from the dad because, well, he felt like he had earned the good grade. And so, uh, you know, don't give me the B or the C. I, I worked hard enough and I've been dutiful in my obedience that I should get that a, that was me. Um, that's how I thought I was supposed to be loving God. I had heard uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 38 taught time and time again in Sunday school and by youth leaders. You remember where Jesus says to that, that person the, the, who came to him, the, the Pharisee, the lawyer, and asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. 
uh, I took this as my marching orders for, you know, this is sort of the marching order for those who are really serious about God. It's not just loving God, it's loving God with all your heart. It's not just loving God with all your heart, it's loving God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. I mean, this is a call to the overachiever to be uber zealous for loving the Lord. I thought that I would impress God with how much I loved him. I would prove it, I would show it. Heck, I would make sure that even Uh, everybody around me could see it. And they would say things like, man, Mark really loves God. Boy, Mark, what a good kid. Boy, you must be proud of your son, Mark. I had taken this command of scripture, the greatest commandment of scripture, and I had turned it into this sort of man-made marching order that I used to prove how good I could be. This is what I thought it meant to love Jesus. Until I came to understand that far more central to the gospel than the command to love Jesus is the truth that Jesus loves me. That to whatever degree I think that I can muster up enough love to show that I really love him. I don't just love him, I really love him. I actually came to understand that far greater than that, is the promise that God loves me. My love is fickle and weak and it's rehearsed (laughs) and it's flawed from the start. The thought actually started to scare me that if it's my love that holds this whole thing together, I'm in trouble. It's not that this command isn't right and true here in Matthew chapter 22, it is. But it's all about the question, how do I love God? How do I love God? And so here's the most important thing that I ever learned uh, about loving God. It's not about me trying to impress him. It's actually about me resting in him. You see, if I use the picture of me driving a car, it's sort of like me driving the car of my Christian life. And I can, I can do one of two things. I can either keep looking in the rear view, the rear view mirror and looking over my shoulder behind me. And I see in the rear view mirror, the finished work of Christ on the cross and this great sacrifice that he, uh, that he gave for me. And I can keep driving that car of the Christian life, looking in the rear view mirror. And as I see the, the keep, looking backwards, feel like I can do enough to to make sure that God knows that I really appreciate that. I can keep trying hard enough to make him feel as though what great thing he did for me, um, I am doing some measure with my life to try to pay that back. Or I can look forward through the windshield of the life of my, uh, of the car of my Christian life. Remembering, confident of what's behind me and what Christ has done for me. But I can look forward, not trying to repay God for anything, full of worship, free, listen, free to fail, constantly in need of Jesus, fighting the urge to be my own savior. And now really, free to experience the joy of my salvation rather than the burden of religion. So confident now that I had sort of stumbled onto something that rang true and just growing weary, maybe like some of you are, of the so-called Christian guilt trip messages that really just sort of fed my own flesh by encouraging me to be the best me that I could be, I actually sought out a better answer to the question, how do I love God? I was encouraged by pastors, older men that I trusted to read church history and to read some of the the wise dead pastors of a bygone era. And my breakthrough moment, my sort of campfire moment came as I read an old book called Religious Affections written by the New England pastor, Jonathan Edwards. 
The scene was the first great awakening in America. It began in the mid 1720s for about 20 years with highs and lows. The spirit of God was on the move. Preaching was powerful and Christ exalting. People were praying, repenting of their sins, bowing their knee in trusting Jesus and following him with their whole heart. But some, as it got started, then some of it started to get weird. And uh, just like the in the New Testament, uh, people see these wonderful supernatural things happening and they wanna get in on it. And so they, uh, they fake it, they force it, they manipulate it, they manufacture sort of this spiritual fervor. And as that started to happen, of course, then some are just wanting to discredit the whole movement of the Great Awakening. This New England pastor, Jonathan Edwards, jumped into the fray of this to say, listen, not all that we see here is of God. That's true. But make no mistake, when God shows up in people's lives, it is far more than seeing just people do the right things. In fact, he went so far as to say that sometimes doing the right things can be merely self-righteous, trying to impress God, man-made religion. And I knew um, that that was me. I was the good grade seeking older brother. Many of the spiritual activities that I had pointed to as proof of my love for God, Jonathan Edwards actually knocked the legs out from under, underneath me saying, those very things that you point to, to, to sort of feel like you really love God um, are the very things that can be faked and manufactured and it's simply just an effort to try to impress God rather than rest in God. Um, that scared me. It scared me because I longed uh, to love God with this wholehearted kind of love like Matthew chapter 22 taught. Now, Edwards' key text as he wrote Religious Affections was 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 where Peter says this, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Uh, I came to understand that love for God is not about doing stuff to impress or to try to pay back or even to look obedient and sacrificial. It's actually all about holy affections. Without this uh, unspeakable joy full of glory that the apostle Peter speaks of, it's merely a human love. And apart from the spirit at work in me, that's all I can do is give a human love. Something so much more when we talk about loving our creator, our king, our Lord and savior. This isn't just my boyfriend or my girlfriend. This isn't just my favorite aunt or uncle. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for me. And Peter says, if it's not a joy unspeakable and full of glory, then you may not even be in the right car at all. But thanks be to God who loves us with a far greater love than a human love, a supernatural love, an unconditional love, a never changing love that surpasses my meager, fickle, uh, failing love. My knowledge wasn't enough. Remember, this was in an Awana scholarship camp that this sort of process first began in me. I had memorized the verses. I knew the doctrines. By this time, I was going to Bible school, but my knowledge wasn't enough. And, you know, it's also the case is my obedience wasn't enough. He wanted, God wanted these holy affections that Edwards was speaking of. 
You say, well, sure, it starts with knowledge. It does. There is content and truth to what we believe as Christ followers. But if I just take a piece of theological doctrinal data and then I try to go do it, to obey it, guess what? It's going to eventually lead to uh, perhaps hypocrisy because I can't keep it up. It, it may lead to burnout because it's just all done in the flesh or even, this explains a lot when you look at people around us, um, even lead to apostasy because that truth has bypassed my affections and gone just into dutiful acts of obedience. Without my heart's delight, uh, my acts of obedience don't please the Lord. And certainly they don't impress him. Uh, in fact, the Bible says time and time again that he actually abhors those things. He abhors doing the right thing with the heart that is far from him because it doesn't honor him as God. It doesn't, it doesn't declare to him that I believe him to be the most glorious thing in my life. You see, there is a vast difference between me knowing something about God and loving the God for whom I now know. Uh, I, I often think of it in terms of my favorite meal, which is a nice, juicy, fat ribeye steak. You see, there is a vast difference between me knowing that there is a cut of beef called a ribeye and then eating it because I need to fill my stomach in order to survive. Or on the other hand, knowing that there is this steak called a ribeye and then desiring it because it smells good and it's sizzling on the grill and the taste of it just melts in my mouth. So I eat it, here it is, because I want it because I want it. The, uh, the pop musician, Selena Gomez said it. The heart wants what it wants. The heart wants what it wants. It's a spot on theological truth. So if the heart wants what it wants, then I need my heart to want the right things. I need these holy affections in my heart so that I want what God wants for me and only God can give me that kind of heart. Only God can give me those holy affections, this unspeakable joy full of glory. So as it turns out, I need to spend more time asking God to give me these desires than trying to convince him that I love him. He knows my heart and he knows that I can't love him like I ought. That's why he sent Jesus. If I could love him this way from my own heart, then I wouldn't need a savior. If I could just make myself feel certain things for him, then I wouldn't need the spirit of God. I could just learn how to be committed. I could learn how to look committed, to even be fanatical like was happening during the first great awakening. Now, my knowledge of the word matters, but not merely to fill my mind, but to give content to my heart, listen, so that the spirit makes the word of God and the God of the word precious to me taste and see that the Lord is good. It was like honey to my mouth and I took it and I ate it. You see, God does want us to know the word so that it might be used of the spirit to produce in us holy affections. And God does want our obedience, but not from a cold, lifeless, duty-bound sense of obligation, rather from this overwhelming desire to walk in a manner worthy of, of the gospel of grace that I've received. It's not that my desires are too strong, as C.S. Lewis said, but that they're too weak. You say the temptations for the things of the world are so great. I just, I, I end up sinning because of these things. And 
the argument that rang true in my own soul was that actually those are the weaker temptations. Those are the weaker desires. I am longing for the lesser things when God wants to stir up in me a longing for the greater things. This is what it means to love God with spirit-filled affections. This was transformative to me, brothers and sisters. As we sit around our little campfire here at the end of May, 2020, in this season that we're in, I would just tell you, I'm fully aware of the coldness of my heart. I'm fully aware of the laziness of my own heart, the laziness of my own will, that I can, I can even own where I am self-righteous. I can own where I'm falling short because it's not dependent upon my love, but on God's love for me. And then I can actually lean into and even boast in my weakness because far more important than my commitment to loving God is his unending promise to never leave or forsake or stop loving me with this covenant kind of love. All right, so here's what I'm asking of you and I'm calling you to. Um, are you trying to impress God with your love or uh, are you resting in his love? Will you own your own self-righteousness or your perhaps indifference? Or will you daily beg God to give you these holy affections, this forward-looking faith that's full of joy in any and every circumstance? He will do it. He promises to do it. To those who will deny themselves, take up their cross and follow him, he promises to do that in you day by day by day, conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, giving you this joy, unspeakable, full of glory. Have you learned this lesson on loving God? Have you learned and are you living this lesson on loving God and of his unending love for you? Campfire number one, do you really love God? I've tried to share with you the most important thing I ever learned about this subject, and I trust it's been a little bit of help to you as perhaps you make an altar commitment kind of moment in your life like I did all those years ago. Let me pray for us. Oh God, thank you for your love for us. We are weak and needy people. We're always weak and needy people. Even as your children redeemed by the love of Jesus, we are still so needy. And you promise to give us everything we need for life and godliness. Not so that we can just keep the rules or perform the traditions, but so that we can experience the joy of our salvation, this unspeakable joy full of glory. And so I pray for us as a church and for all who are listening tonight, that spirit of God, you would take us deeper, move us further, help us to embrace your love through understood through your word, stirring up holy affections in us so that we might go and be the people that you've called us to be out of an overflowing love to worship you with our lives. In your name I pray, amen.